guts and glory of probiotics with their promising performance. To a hypothetical microbial conference. Oh, why did we microbes gather here? It's not the time to yawn, dear comrades. It's time to conquer the world. How can we tiny microbes conquer the world? Why should we conquer the world now? Yeah, we don't have to. We just have to find a safe place to settle down. Is there such a place? We can invade the human body. Why will they accept us? We will offer them a deal they can't refuse. We can help them in efficiently metabolizing their food, train their immune system and protect them from pathogens. How can we predict what they will eat? We don't have to. We will make them eat what we need. As the human brain loves serotonin, we will supply them with it whenever they eat the food that we like. We will form the gut brain axis. So we have the power to transform what they eat into what we need. We are like alchemists. Yes, yes we, we are, are the bioalchemists. Bio How do these bioalchemists influence our body? To understand this, scientists at NIH came up with a project in 2008 called the Human Microbiome Project. This has been described as a logical, conceptual and experimental extension of the Human Genome Project. What do you think the main aim behind it? Of course, to characterize the microbial communities found in the human body and to identify each microorganism's role in health and disease. What do they do characterizing it? It is to develop a reference set of microbial genome sequences to perform preliminary characterization of human microbiome. And this international project led to these outcomes. They found that there are more bacterial cells in our body than our own cells and most of them are in our gut and the protein coding genes are 360 times more abundant than human protein coding genes. Together, genes of microbial symbionts provide traits that humans need not evolve on their own. What happens if we lose them? Let's make it simple. Do you know where the richest biodiversity of the world reside? Of course, it's the Amazon rainforest. But where do you think the richest biodiversity in our body reside? Maybe it's our gut? Yes, it is. It contains the largest and most diverse microbial community in our body. What happens if we disrupt Amazon's diversity? It leads to loss of species diversity which further affects the interdependent ecological cycles across the globe. In the same way, if we disrupt our own microbial diversity by altering our dietary habits, over usage of antibiotics and more alcohol intake, it results in imbalance of microbiota called dysbiosis. How does that affect us? Dysbiosis may lead to Clostridium difficile infections, inflammatory bubble disease, obesity, origin spectrum disorders, multiple sclerosis, atherosclerosis, diabetes and metabolic syndrome by involving gut brain axis, immune modulations and gut liver fat axis. But lost ones are lost. We can't do anything about them, right? When there is deforestation, there will be afforestation to do. Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. It was the Russian scientist Elie Mechnikov who first thought of replacing putrefactor bacteria with lactic acid bacteria to achieve ball health. Taking it a step further, Minoru Shirota discovered isolated bacterial flora that serve out a roller coaster ride in our gut, now known as Lactobacillus casei strain Shirota. These efforts led to the creation of Yakal, a probiotic. What is a probiotic? According to WHO, probiotics are live microorganisms which, when administered in adequate amounts, confer a health benefit to the host. Why do we need them? With the increasing antimicrobial resistance and skyrocketing cost of new antibiotics, probiotics are need of the hour. Are they really beneficial to us? Yes. Apart from increasing our immunity and helping our GI by producing organic acids, nutrients and enzymes for digestion, they protect us from bad bacteria by producing bacteriosins. Can we use them to treat diseases? Of course, diseases can be treated. For example, antibiotic associated diarrhea can be treated by using Saccharomyces boulardii. It also has synergistic effect with Lactobacillus in the treatment of Clostridium difficile infection. Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium together can be used in reducing relative risk of necrotizing enterocolitis. Bifidobacterium alone can also be used to treat IBD. Are they used to treat only GI disorders? No, they are also used in allergies, obesity and weight management, osteoporosis, ventilator associated pneumonia and so on. 
But how much do we really know about probiotics? To know about the awareness on probiotics, we have conducted a survey among university students using a pre-designed semi-structured questionnaire. The questionnaire is of two parts. First half is to assess their knowledge followed by an awareness video regarding probiotics and gut microbes. The second half of the questionnaire is to assess their knowledge and attitude towards probiotics. In the study, we got a convenient sample of 452 students which included both medical and non-medical and these are our results. Among all the students, only two-fifths of the non-medical students are aware of gut microbes and their benefits on health, whereas four-fifths of the medical students are aware of gut microbes and among them, only three-fifths know about their benefits on health. Seven out of ten medical students know about probiotics mostly through books and internet. Only two out of ten non-medical students know about probiotics. Nearly 60% of the medical students know that their daily diet contains microbes. On the other hand, only 35% of the non-medical students are aware of them. 7 among 10 medical students consume probiotics in various formulations. Why 1 among 10 non-medical students consume probiotics? After the awareness video, we have found half of the medical and non-medical students consider that probiotics are useful to make our life healthy. 4 out of every 10 medical students and 5 out of every 10 non-medical students are concerned about the effectiveness of probiotics. Two-fifths of all the students are concerned about the attitude of healthcare professionals towards probiotics. To know more about probiotics, gut microbes and their extent in clinical use, we have taken opinions of healthcare professionals from various departments. According to psychiatrists, anxiety and depression and other autism-like disorders can be treated by using probiotics. But these are still under clinical trials in animals. According to gastroenterologist Dr. V. Ramesh Kumar, probiotics are useful in treating clostridium deficit infections, chronic constipation, antibiotic-induced diarrhea and IBD by using various strains of bacteria. They are all useful, but some of them can only be used by the prescription of doctors. Of all the researchers done on gut microbiota over the past 40 years, 80% of them were done in the recent 5 years. This simple finding highlights the fact that this field of research is of remarkable importance as they reveal the role of microbes in the treatment of several diseases, leading to the concept of microbiome therapy. There are several approaches in microbiome therapy. Fecal microbiota transplant peak the game changer. The first word that strikes our minds when we hear the term FMT is the word feces. FMT is the weirdest, grossest, yet most, na most natural. I mean, it's nothing new. We all might have heard of few animals like hippos, pandas feeding on their mother's feces. A natural process called coprophagia. We've gained a greater understanding on FMT after we met Dr. Manik Das, HOD of Microbiology at Apollo Hospitals. FMT is a process of taking stool from a healthy screen donor, mixing it with liquid, concentrating the bacterial portion and administering it to a sick person, usually via retention edema. Feces is a stinky, messy, magical mass of microbes and we don't often think of it as a medicine. It's like the dank soil of an old growth forest teeming with life. And for fetal transplant, it can be like taking a truckload of soil from the forest and moving it to barren lands to repopulate it. Who came up with this idea first? Ji Hong, a 4th century Chinese physician, described the administration of human fecal suspension by mouth to treat severe diarrhea. And in modern times, the first recorded usage is in US in 1958 when a group of physicians broke one of the deepest human taboos and gave filters to, to their patients suffering from infective colitis as an enema. And miraculously, their patients were saved from the brink of death. Clostridium deficit, a nasty, weedy bacterium that can cause chronic, painful, yellowish diarrhea. Overintake of antibiotics results in resistance, leading to increased use of antibiotics and increased deterioration of gut microbiota, finally leading to recurrent C. difficile infection. Scientists finally came up with a material that can cure recurrent C. difficile infection and that is poop. FMD is now considered the last resort in the treatment of recurrent C. difficile infection. WHO keeps poop under investigational new drug. Known that poop is a drug, no drug comes with zero side effects. Even FMD has certain side effects like constipation, bloating, etc. Coming to the challenges with FMT, the first challenge they have faced is the risk of transmission of viruses and bacteria even with careful donor screening. And next is doubtful sample stability. Lastly, 
risk of developing obesity. FMT is being done at various places in India. We are just at the tip of iceberg. Many clinical trials are being done on germ-free mice targeting the extra-intestinal diseases. Mice treated with lactobacillus rhamnosus have shown to exhibit less depression-like symptoms. Similarly, use of bacterial fragilis in mice has shown to correct the communication of normalities in autism spectrum disorders and also help in the prevention of multiple sclerosis. This unraveling cycle of sequencing and exploring led to a more confined spectrum of study under the term postbiotics. Simply, postbiotics are the metabolic byproducts released by bacteria. Instead of altering the microbiota through prebiotics, probiotics and FMT, postbiotics have direct therapeutic value. Studies in mice have shown that postbiotics have immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory effects. The time is right for postbiotic therapies to be developed in the near future. In the future, probiotics might become as significant as vitamins in our diet due to the increasing number and diversity of our gut microbes. But the best way to restore the balance is by taking prebiotic foods like bananas, legumes, etc. Though neglected, our gut microbes play a key role not just in our GI and immune system but also influence our mental health through the gut-brain axis. In fact, even the brain was not always held in high regard. The heart was thought to be a center of intelligence. But by the advancements in science and technology, we came to know the role of our brain and its influence on our body. Similarly, we are on the brink of unlocking yet another mystery of the human body. If successful, it will be a huge leap in the field of healthcare, leading to personalized diet and medicines similar to personalized searches. So friends, no, no gas, no glory. That was a spectacular performance. I'd like to welcome our beloved principal, Dr. Sheshikala Ma'am, professor in the Department of Microbiology, Osmania Medical College, Hyderabad. She is the Dean of Academic Affairs at Osmania Medical College. She is also the President of Indian Association of Medical Microbiology. Ma'am is the driving force behind the new phase of Osmania Medical College. Thank you so much for coming here, ma'am. Thank you so much. immunocompromised patients, they should be taken only after they have taken prescription from doctor. They can't be used as such. There should be a prescription from doctor or suggestion from a doctor to use them. Uh, probiotics are natural products. They are bacteria already found in our gut. So in normal people, uh, there is no known side effects except some people can experience constipation or bloating after using a probiotic. Uh, no, uh, people have people have died during the fecal microbial transplantations, uh, and uh, those people have died because they were already immunocompromised patients. Uh, they have risked actually before the surgery, like they knew that before the transplantation they had the risk. Uh, one person has died, and the other person is still under treatment. Also, the stool wasn't screened properly; it had resistant E. coli in them. So. Uh, we are uh, 
Yeah, every person has a different microbial composition. In fact, uh, we all share 99.9% .9 of our DNA, but we only share 10% of our gut microbes. So there's a lot of study which, is, which has to be done. And uh, even like there are many projects, like the American Gut Project was done in 2015 across 42 countries, and 15,000 samples were obtained. Similarly, MetaHead and other projects are being done. In India, the Indian Microbiome Project is uh, initiated in Jan this year. So after the projects are done and we have the perfect data, we, as we said in our video, we would be able to devise personalized diets, medicines and all. So we are waiting for it. It's an exciting project. So but actually what I have is it is 20% As we previously mentioned, this, uh, the same problem was faced in immu immunocompromised patients only, but not others. Extremely immunocompromised and they should be children. Uh, and uh, in children and old people, already they will be immunocompromised and again, uh, immunosuppressive state is uh, super improved, then uh, the sepsis condition. It was not banned actually, uh, WHO has given a safety alert over it that uh, it should be screened for multi-drug resistant bacteria and uh, extended spectrum beta lactamases. Yeah. It, it was... It, uh, as, as I told uh, it already in the video, like risk of transmission of viruses and bacteria even with careful donor screening, like they are the challenges faced by FMD right now and doubtful sample stability and risk of developing obesity and risk of transmission of resistant bacteria uh, from the donor. Doctors specifically advise their patient not to take an immunocompromised statement. Okay, thank you. I think there are a lot of questions. I mean, we're running short of time, I think. Right? Thank you. Congratulations.